morning, and welcome to this online worship service here at the Old Presbyterian Meeting House in Alexandria, Virginia. Know that wherever you are on your journey of faith, you are always, always welcome here. Today we commemorate Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday, marking two critical events in Holy Week. Later this week, we'll commemorate Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, two other critical events in the life of Christ that help prepare us for Easter. More information about those services will be shared later in the service and on our website. If you are a person looking for a new church home, we hope you'll consider joining this vibrant faith community. If you'd like to have a conversation about that, please don't hesitate to give me or another member of staff a call. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. The Lord be with you. Let us worship God. Look, your king is coming, humble and riding on a donkey. Hosanna to the son of David. Lay your cloaks before him, spread palms to honor him. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Raise your voices, lift your hearts. Rejoice, our Savior comes. Hosanna in the highest heaven.
according to the scriptures, if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, then God, who is faithful and just, promises to forgive us. So let us go to God in prayer and make our confession. The journey you lead, O Lord, is draining, demanding, and fraught with danger. You ask us to stay by your side as you make your way through Jerusalem to the cross. But weariness and fear overtake us. Like the first disciples, we are too quick to betray you, deny you, abandon you. Forgive us, we pray, and strengthen us for the journey ahead. Give us courage to face the pain and suffering of this world and to respond with compassion. As the darkness gathers, renew our faith, fill us with hope, and startle us with your grace. Hear now the prayers we bring to you in silence. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn us? Well, only Christ. But Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, and Christ reigns in power for us. So be at peace and know that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Scripture readings for this Lord's Day comes to us again from the Gospel of Mark. I'll be reading selections from both chapter 11 and 15. Together, let us listen to God's Word. When Jesus and his disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and they found a coat tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the coat? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed him to take it. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and spread others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. And then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Blessed is the one whose coming kingdom is our ancestor David. And then later, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and they led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, you say so. And then the chief priest accused him of many things. So Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they ask. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. And so the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. And then Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them and after flogging Jesus, handed him over to be crucified. And then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck him in the head with a reed. They spat upon him and knelt down in homage to him. And after mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him out to crucify him. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And at last Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this day he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello, everyone. We're so glad you can join us for the time with children. We're the Simmons family. I'm Raleigh. I'm Eloise. I'm Beth. And I'm Scott. Today we remember a very special event in the life of Jesus. Today has a special name. Do you know what it is? Palm Sunday! That's right. Today is called Palm Sunday, and we remember it as the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. The people were so excited that Jesus was coming to the city. They cut down palm branches and waved them in the air to welcome him, just like some of you did in the video for our virtual, virtual procession. As Jesus rode into the city, they shouted, Hosanna, which means praise the Lord. Can you say that? Hosanna, praise the Lord. The people celebrated and cheered on Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem. We've been talking about people praising Jesus and waving palm branches, which are types of leaves from a tree. Now, I'd like you to look at your hands. The part of your hand that connects all your fingers together is also called a palm. How many fingers do you have? Five. That's right, five. Today after worship, at lunch or dinner, or any time that works for your family, we invite you and your family to think of five ways to praise God. Five praises for God can be anything you're thankful for. For example, our family thought of these five praises. We thank God for laughter and fun with friends. 
We thank God for our dog, Sophie. We thank God for books. We thank God for beautiful weather. We thank God for our church family. This story of Jesus is the first story of a very special week known as Holy Week. Later this week, we will have worship recognizing Jesus' last supper with his disciples. We call, call this Maundy Thursday. On Friday, we will have worship, worship to remember the day Jesus died on the cross. And the next Sunday, we celebrate the good news, which is what? Easter! You're right, celebrating that Jesus is alive. We spent this week getting ready for Easter by remembering the stories of Jesus' last days, remembering the love Jesus has for each of us. Let us pray. Dear God, Dear, Dear God, God, thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank, thank you for giving us Jesus, who loves us so much. Who loves us so much. Help us to follow Jesus. Help us to follow Jesus each and every day. Each and every day. May God be with you there. May God be with us here. May God be with everyone everywhere. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. <clears throat> oh God, we come with palms in hand to sing Hosanna not really knowing what we're doing, or more to the point, not really knowing what you are doing. So send your spirit among us to enlighten us with your word and to find our place in this story of salvation. Amen. <clears throat> well, today we mark what the lectionary calls Palm and Passion Sunday. It's a troubling marriage of two very different stories. But it's a telling one, especially so in this troubling time in our history. Over the years, I've approached these stories from a variety of perspectives, each of them, I hope, in some helpful way. But this year, this year, it is the crowds in these stories that grab my attention. I am struck by how quickly and easily they flip the script and move from shouts of adoration to shouts of condemnation. And as you might expect, I am struck by what their actions reveal about human nature, including yours and mine. As I read these stories, I could not help but think of what took place in our nation's capital on January 6. As you will recall, there was a large and adoring crowd gathered on the ellipse for a rally in support of our outgoing president. Many in the crowd wore caps or costumes in patriotic colors. Some carried homemade signs, while others enthusiastically waved flags. Most everyone joined in a chorus of praise. And by all accounts, it was a festive and mostly peaceful event. But within a matter of hours, many in that crowd flipped the script and marched to the capital to condemn the very government they claimed to support. And some, some took it even further by destroying government property and using their flagpoles to maim and kill public officials. Historians and political scientists, not to mention investigative journalists and members of the intelligence community, are trying hard to figure out what caused that crowd to change so quickly and easily from adoration to condemnation. Thanks to their work, we now know that some had been plotting and planning such things all along. But why? Why were so many others caught up in that moment? What caused people like you and like me to join in what many are calling an insurrection? To borrow from Catherine Percy's excellent commentary on today's text, it is one thing to be part of a praise chorus. It's another thing entirely to identify with people who called for blood. Hershey is right, of course. They are two very different things. 
But given the right circumstances, we are more than capable of doing both. As Pershy goes on to say, there is in our nature a shadow side. We may have the capacity to offer magnificent praise, but we also have the capacity to be violent, treacherous, unfaithful. The history books and even the nightly news programs are chocked full of examples of these two sides of human nature. And so is the Bible. Mark's palm and passion stories are a case in point. And taken together, they help us to understand why we are so prone to flip the script and move so quickly and easily from adoration to condemnation. By the time Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, the people are primed for a party. Many have been waiting for a new king to establish a new kingdom in this city of kings. And given what they have seen or heard about Jesus and his miraculous powers, they are more than ready to join the royal processional and sing their hosannas. But once it becomes clear that he is not the kind of king they had been expecting, well, let's just say they are more than ready to join with those who had been plotting to get rid of Jesus all along. It's a script we've all read, a scene we've all witnessed. And more to the point, it's a scene in which many of us, wittingly or unwittingly, have too often played a role. In his commentary on today's lessons, Tom Long points to some of the script flipping that occurs throughout Mark's gospel. It begins with Jesus, the strong man, the hero, adored by the crowds for his dazzling display of gifts. And it ends with the crowds turning on Jesus and leaving him to die. As Long reminds us, at the beginning of Mark, Jesus calls disciples to follow him, and they do immediately. But in the end, they all desert him and flee. At the beginning of Mark, the crowds are crazy about Jesus. So many flock to him that he could no longer travel the countryside freely. In the end, the crowds turn on Jesus and demand his execution. It's a tragic story, a story that makes many of us cringe. We wonder how people can do such things, whether in Jerusalem or Washington, D.C. To paraphrase Percy, we are likely to assume that we would not have done what the people who were actually there did. But we look back on the events of Holy Week through the benefit of Easter. So it is hard for us to imagine that we might have participated in the events that led to our Savior's death. But the crowd that encircled Jesus did not know where the story was going. They only knew that Jesus was not what they had expected and was fast becoming a threat to their way of life. Well, dear friends, therein lies the rub for you and for me and for so many others as well. For when our way of life is threatened by something real or imagined, we tend to stop singing our praise choruses and start calling for blood. The Bible scholar Nancy Pittman explains it this way. Whenever someone speaks out against the commonly accepted order on behalf of the dispossessed, we crank up the background check machinery to find some dirt on that someone. Whenever someone reminds us that God is not particularly interested in our amassing wealth, pursuing war, or dividing society into winners or losers, we race to the blogosphere to find out what is wrong with that person. Whenever someone makes a claim about understanding more fully the purpose of God for our communities, well, the gossip, the innuendo, and the accusations spread quickly in an effort to undermine credibility and redefine that person's status 
among us. I believe it's even worse than that. Because these days, we don't just limit such actions to individuals. We willingly and often enthusiastically apply them to whole classes of people, even to our elected representatives, especially when we perceive them to be a threat to our way of life. And thanks to a 24 hours a day news cycle, thanks to Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter feeds, it is easier to do than ever and more effective. It often seems that our shadow side is the dominant side, and at times, even the preferred side. Well, that certainly seems to have been the case in Jerusalem. Why else would they have stopped singing their praise chorus and started calling for blood? But thankfully, None of that matters in the end, because it is God, not them, and certainly not us, who will have the last word in this story. As some of you may recall from one of my Advent sermons, Mark's gospel is about the good news. It's right there in the opening sentence, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So remembering that, we might well ask, how is today's lesson good news? Well, to play off something Long said in his commentary, the good news told by Mark is that God's power is not like human power. Indeed not. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, but he is not like David or for that matter, any other powerful potentate. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a borrowed coat, not a war horse. He identifies mostly with the poor and the powerless, not the rich and the powerful. His role is to serve, not to be served. He said he came to serve, save sinners like you and like me, people who are all too prone to flip the script and give in to their shadow side. To paraphrase Long, on the surface, Jesus looks like one being manhandled by the powers of darkness. But Jesus walks confidently, faithfully, obediently, all the way to the cross. Jesus knows who he is and what he has come to do. And so he prays, Abba, Father, not what I want, but what you want. He is through it all. An obedient son who has come to offer his life for many. Let us not forget that in Mark's gospel, it is not so much what we do or fail to do that matters it is what Jesus does for us and for the world God loves. In Mark's gospel, Jesus moves intentionally toward the cross, repeatedly predicting his death and explaining it as a ransom for many. He has told us that his body is broken and his blood is shed in order to inaugurate a new covenant between God and humanity. And as we learned last week, when he is lifted up on the cross, in his resurrection, and his ascension to follow, he will draw all people to himself, proving once again that self-giving love is the currency of the new life he offers to us and to the world. If you want to flip the script... That's the way to do it. Amen. Having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us affirm what we believe by using words from a declaration of faith. We confess, we confess that, that in the execution, execution of Jesus, the sin of the human race reached its depths. 
The only innocent one was condemned and put to death, not by the sinfulness of one nation, but by the sinfulness of us all. In the presence of Jesus, who lived out what God wants us all to be, we were threatened beyond endurance. Blinded by our rebellion against our Creator, we killed His Son when we met Him face to face. In His lonely agony on the cross, Jesus was acting on behalf of God, manifesting God's love that takes on itself the loneliness pain, and death that result from our waywardness. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to God's self, not holding our sins against us. He is our only hope in life and in death. Friends, as we seek to hold on to our true hope in life and in death, I encourage you to continue to root yourself in this community of faith. Join us Sunday mornings at 10 for the children's ministry time or for the adult education class. We won't have classes on Easter morning, but we'll pick up again on April 11th as Meeting House member Peyton McCrary will reflect on on enforcing the Voting Rights Act, looking particularly at how it speaks to responding to the current racial crisis and how Presbyterians can fit in. I also want to note that if you'd like to dedicate Easter flowers, the deadline for that is tomorrow, and the link can be found on our church's website. Nearly 40 days ago, we entered into this Lenten season. We began with ashes, contemplating the truth of our mortality and acknowledging our sin. We were invited to recommit ourselves as disciples of Jesus to journeying deeper and deeper into faith. We were invited to release whatever is in our lives that is holding us back from the life to which God calls us, to release the deadness we often carry in order to make room for God's creating spirit to work within us. We were invited to attend to those relationships in our lives and in our society that are strained or broken, and to seek God's guidance into how we might repair them. We were invited to recognize our particular gifts and to prayerfully consider how we might better use them in the service of God's kingdom. We were invited to rethink our lives and our priorities in light of the particular challenges and also opportunities of this time with the goal of working toward God's kingdom of abundance for all, filled with the gifts of the Spirit. And now, as we enter Holy Week, we are called to remember. We remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, filled with joy and praise and anticipation. We remember the week he spent in Jerusalem, the tension building as he preached and taught and confronted the powers that be. We remember how that week ended, a meal shared with disciples, time spent in the garden in prayer, Jesus' betrayal and arrest and trial, his death on a cross, his body sealed in a tomb. We remember Immersed in the story of God's love and human sin, a story of betrayal and forgiveness, of suffering and death, all pointing us toward that Sunday morning when the sun rises and the stone is rolled away. We remember to renew our spirits, to sustain our faith, to deepen our understanding and to call forth our love. We invite you to remember with us in this Holy Week. Although we had to move our prayer stations to yesterday because of the weather forecast, you can still participate in the last of these stations through the weekly video reflection that will be emailed out on Monday. Or come by any day this week as the same materials can be found in a box in front of the sanctuary. Join us on Monday, Thursday in the Presbyterian Cemetery at 6.30 for an in-person worship service. 
we ask that you sign up on the church website. You can also follow along on the live stream at home. The link to our Good Friday service will be emailed out Friday morning, and the service will reflect on the passion of Christ through scripture, prayer, and the music of Rudder's Requiem. And on Easter Day, worship with the online service in your home and then join us in the churchyard from 9 to 11 that morning, bringing flowers to add to the cross and add your touch to the glorious Easter banner that will be waiting to greet you that morning. As we walk through this holy week, please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you are in need of pastoral care or help of any kind. Although we can't physically pass the offering plate right now, we are still called to give of ourselves. Each Sunday we bring our offerings before God, and I encourage you to stay current with your giving to the church. On both this Sunday and Easter Sunday, we also join many churches across the nation in receiving the one great hour of sharing offering. You're invited to give at the link on the screen or through the Give Online tab on the church's website. Your gifts support three programs of the Presbyterian Church that work to serve individuals and communities in need through disaster response or ongoing community development. I hope that you will give generously as we seek to share God's love with the world. Let us pray together. On this Sunday, God, we raise our voices in praise and we also contemplate the sin and darkness of this world. We offer up to you our thanksgiving as spring emerges with the warmth and the flowers and the signs of new life. We are grateful for vaccines that spread protection more and more each day. We are grateful for hope and kindness and generosity. We are grateful for faith that grounds and guides us. We are grateful for the promise we hold on to as we call out our hosannas. But we are also all too aware, God, that the darkness of the cross is still present in the world. We know that the promise and joy of Easter are real, but we also know that sin and evil and suffering and death are real too. And so, God, we lift our prayers to you. We pray for those who walk a difficult path. We pray for those struggling to meet their basic needs. We pray especially for those whose lives or businesses have been upended by this pandemic. Hear our prayers, God, this day. We pray also for those bearing the weight of injustice for people who are persecuted, for those living in societies that are not free. And we pray, God, for all touched by the sin of racism or by any of the ways in which we distort or reject differences among us. Hear our prayers, God, this day. We pray also, God, for those who feel isolated and alone. We pray for those who betray and for those who have been betrayed. We pray, God, that you might be present in our relationships, those that strengthen us and those that are strained or bent or broken. We pray, God, for those who face death and for those who grieve. We pray, God, for healing we ask healing for all in body, mind, and spirit. We ask healing for our community and our nation in all that we face. We grieve this week again the lives of those who have been killed by guns. God, heal us, we pray. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, knowing that in Christ you bear the suffering of the world. Strengthen and sustain us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you continue your journey to the cross, know that you are not the first person, nor will you be the last person to flip the script from adoration to condemnation. But know too that while you are weak, Jesus is strong. Where your faith falters, Jesus' faith flourishes. And that in the end, it is Jesus who will flip the script on sin and death and raise you up with him in glory. May that good news keep you strong and give you hope. And may the blessings of our loving God be with you and all God's people, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>